Hi, everybody, and welcome to FISMA Fridays. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining and taking some time here on a Friday morning for some of you on the, the West Coast and uh, start of a Friday afternoon uh, here on the East Coast. So um, appreciate everyone joining today. Uh, our topic today is the final rule for food defense, and that's what we're going to be discussing here in our half-hour session. Uh, just to go through a couple things as we uh, start, and if I can make the slide move forward, we're going to be set. Here we go. So, uh, thank goodness it's FISMA Friday, right? Uh, I'm your host today. I'm Dave Detweiler, the VP of Sales from Safety Chain. And just before we get started, uh, I want to let you know, and I, a lot of times these questions come up, there will be a recording link uh, that the sent out uh, next week, beginning of next week. Uh, we'll send out the recording to everybody here online so you can review and uh, if you don't have the chance to stay on the whole time, you can catch up on anything you might have missed. Also, uh, we do have some questions that have been submitted that we're going to walk through today uh, in regard to this. Uh, but obviously, you'll have the opportunity to submit some questions as well uh, from within the WebEx uh, as we go through the discussion today, and we'll field some of those questions at the end of the call. Uh, you may notice that you only see yourself and the panelists here. Uh, that's for privacy, obviously. Uh, there are a, a bunch of people online with you today, and uh, thanks for everybody attending again. Um, if you do have any issues with audio, which we've tended to find sometimes in these sessions, uh, please feel free. There's a dial-in number uh, within the WebEx that you can dial in if you're having trouble hearing this on your computer. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, we're going to walk through a couple pre-submitted questions on today's topic, uh, and we'll talk briefly about how uh, the Atchison Group and Safety Chain might help, and then we'll, we'll also go through the audience Q&A. Uh, as we get started. So uh, today with us, we have uh, Paymon Katimi uh, from the Ashton Group. Hi, Paymon. How are you doing today on Friday? Hello, Dave. Uh, good to be back. And hello, everybody. Good to be back on Business Friday again. Great. Thanks for joining us, Paymon. And uh, we look forward to the, the next, the upcoming 30 minutes here. So thanks for joining us again. And uh, let's you. let's jump right into this. So. Uh, Hey, Mon, how about, uh, how about we get started and talk about any of the latest updates from FISMA and, and items that may have come up recently since our last time we got together? How about that? Sure. Uh, nothing of particular uh, major changes other than the fact that the final of the seven rules that the FDA was mandated by the court was uh, finalized and, and made public, and which is a food defense rule, and it represents a a major kind of milestone for the FDA because now they were they met the court mandated deadline for enacting and implementation of the rules, and now we're just waiting for the guidance documents to hopefully start making their way. Um, uh, other than that, uh, we are seeing that the Food Safety Pre Preventive Control Alliance has finally finalized a curriculum for preventive controls rules for animal foods and has started to offer a joint PCQI and lead instructor training. And so that's going to uh, roll out further, more emails to come, and so stay tuned on those for those who are interested. And that's it. So just waiting for the guidances and uh, getting FISMA implemented, Dave. That's that's awesome, Tamon, and you're absolutely right, right? It's, it's an exciting time, right, to see this all kind of come together and, and uh, obviously get passed through and, and, and get this started for sure. Um, so we're looking forward to that guidance. Uh, and as we move into what this month's discussion is specifically about, we're talking about the final rule on food defense, right? And uh, what we're going to do is we'll walk through a couple couple questions here for Paymon as, as you guys uh, on the phone with us today, as, as you think about some questions and so forth, don't, don't be afraid to submit those questions uh, via the Q&A. Uh, in your WebEx, uh, and if you have any problems with that, I will open it back up so you can see uh, and submit some more as we go through this. So let's hop right in here and talk about topic number one, Paymon, the, the idea that uh, what's the, the food defense rule really focus on, right, and, and maybe kind of give us some clarity there if it's possible. Of course, yeah, good question. At, at a high level, the food defense rule is really focused on preventing wide-scale public health harm due to intentional adulteration. This could be due to terror, sabotage, counterfeiting, 
and requires domestic and international companies that are registered with the FDA to develop a food defense plan that is based on determining vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the system within the entire company system and implementing a set of mitigating steps that we'll talk about to reduce the risk. The rule is designed generally to cover larger companies because their product reach greater number of people, so the public exposure is greater, and thus the regulation really exempts very small businesses, and we'll explain what those are, and sets a higher dollar threshold for the definition of a very small business than the other FISMA final rules do in terms of what they define a, a small or very small business. Some of the other important distinction is to make sure everybody understands that economically motivated adulteration is not part of this food defense rule. That one is largely covered under the preventive controls rules. So the focus of this rule is prevention of widespread public health uh, risk due to intentional contamination and that requires companies to put together a game plan, a food defense plan, to address their vulnerabilities. Now they do provide some exemptions here as I mentioned, there are very small business um, requirements, and those are companies that, on a three-year average, have a revenue under $10 million and have a five-year window of providing documentation justification for their very small business status. Those companies that are involved in holding the food except when it's in liquid storage tanks, are also exempt from the food defense rule. The packing or repacking, uh, labeling or relabeling, where the primary packaging is not compromised and the food is not contacted, uh, operations that are involved in that part are also exempt from the food defense rule. Um, additional activities uh, that fall within the definition of farm are also exempt those that are involved in manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding foods for animal production are also exempt. Uh, those involved in alcoholic beverage production under certain conditions, they're exempt. And uh, those that are on-farm manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding uh, by small or very small businesses, that the only thing they do is uh, foods that are identified as having low risk. Uh, I think the FDA identifies those as certain types of eggs and game meats. They're exempt. Uh, in comparison, those companies that fall under the juice and seafood hazard actually do have to comply to the food defense rule, uh, whereas they are exempt under the preventive controls rules for human animal foods of FISMA. And those facilities that are in uh, pilot plans or, food or research type facilities that are registered with the FDA are also required to uh, comply to the, to the food defense rule and come up with a food defense plan. So as a whole, we're looking at, again, preventing wide-scale public health harm and identifying where those vulnerabilities exist within companies and coming up with a set of mitigating strategies that we'll talk about in more depth uh, throughout this uh, discussion. Back to you, Dave. Well, yeah, wow, that was, uh, that was a mouthful there, Peyron, right? Uh, it sounds like a lot of intricacies, right, as we walk through it. Um, and that kind of leads us nicely into uh, topic number two, which had come in, right? What, what are the key elements needed to comply with the, the food defense rule, uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing that? Sure. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice follow up to the question, and as I mentioned, each facility must prepare a written food defense plan and implement that food defense plan, which assesses and identifies the vulnerabilities and actionable process steps that exist within the facility. So what are those? What is a vulnerability or significant vulnerability? The FDA defines it as a point or a step in the process that is susceptible to intentional alteration that can cause widespread wide-scale public health harm. So those are significant vulnerabilities, and the actionable process step is where that significant vulnerability exists and a mitigating strategy, a, an action is being deployed to reduce the risk. 
So you have to identify and assess where significant vulnerabilities are, implement and mitigation strategies, and these are all must be written and explained and justified for taking action. And of course, you have those mitigation strategies, you have to manage them. That includes monitoring of the strategies, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, you have to have written procedures for taking corrective actions in an event that uh, there's deviation from, uh, from the uh, mitigation strategies, and verification steps that monitoring and corrective actions are taking place and that the vulnerability is being minimized and uh, there's a requirement for reanalysis at a minimum every three years or as needed due to changes to the process, to the product, to the vulnerability, and if FDA recognizes a new vulnerability and risk that needs to be managed by the industry. So those, that's the key elements needed and approaches uh, that we'll talk about the companies need to take. What they're as far as uh, what they're focused on, uh, well, while the FDA is really looking at every vulnerability within a process, they are going to be paying special attention and focusing on certain process access points, such as bulk liquid receiving and loading, liquid storage and handling, secondary ingredient handling where the ingredient is being added, and mixing and similar activities. These are the points where widespread dissemination of the potential adulterant uh, could occur and increase the public health exposure risk. In the previous proposed rules, these were referred to as key activity types and were intentionally left out of the final rule, but will be referred to in the guidance document that will be issued eventually. And um, FDA does recognize that conducting vulnerability assessment using them is an acceptable approach or as a, as a starting point because those are the most vulnerable points that have been identified. So essentially we are assessing where the vulnerabilities are, we're looking at those points and determining how the risk of intentional alteration is being mitigated at each step and looking at very specific ones such as bulk liquid storage and handling as, as areas that are going to be of particular interest to the FDA. Back to you. That's, uh, so, Peyman, is it, is it fair to say that it's pretty consistent with a lot of these rules, right? You, you kind of use a similar terminology, right? Yeah, there's an assessment you need to document, then you need to record and monitor, and then you need to be able to report, right? I mean, it, it's kind of a similar process. It, it just kind of, we're, we're picking out the different areas to kind of focus on. Is that a, is that a fair statement, or is that Absolutely. Too, too they do take a very much a HACCP-like approach of, of yeah. risk analysis, hazard analysis, uh, monitoring, you know, actionable monitoring yep. steps and verification, documentation, reanalysis, very much the same approach, yeah. Fair enough. Thanks for that. So let, let's, uh, let's move along here. So, you know, how, how me as a facility, right, how am I supposed to comply, uh, to approach that compliance on the rule, you know? Uh, what, I, I think you mentioned some of the things I can do here right around an assessment document, but is there anything else to add? What can I, what can I go through to do here at the facility? Yeah, so we'll dive a little deeper in this question. I think this one uh, uh, you know, all kind of follows nicely. As, as you just mentioned, and I think you, that was a great lead to this one, is that it is much like a hazard approach to addressing uh, a hazard analysis uh, when you're addressing intentional alteration. As we discussed, you have to first assess the significant vulnerability. And what, how do you do that? The questions that you need to ask is, what is the potential public health impact here? you know, in terms of severity and the scale. Things to consider is things like volume of the product, number of servings, the potential number of exposures, how quickly the food is going to make it through the supply chain and into the consumer's hands. And then in terms of the agent, what is their infectious dose, lethal dose, if that applies, and possible number of illnesses or deaths. So that's the public health impact component. And then, on a, on a phys facility standpoint, the degree of physical access to the product and determining presence and effectiveness, um, let's say starting from the facility grounds, such as access from the outside, uh, through gates, railing, doors, and then within the facility, within the process, um, such as lids, seals, 
and shield. So we talked about the health in impact and potential health impact from the public standpoint, physical access, and lastly, the ability of the attacker to successfully contaminate the product. And we're asking how easily can they introduce the agent to the products, mix it uniformly or as evenly as possible, and um, how much time and kind of alone time do they have to, to get this done? So these are part of the significant vulnerability assessment. It is kind of interesting that the FDA specifically points out, points out that existing measures, and in many cases companies do have existing measures that are applied to the process that are not part of the normal process, such as locks, entry points, peer or supervisor reviews, that it should be considered after the vulnerability assessment. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when, when evaluating that vulnerability of a, let's say, a mixing tank, which is among the areas that FDA will focus on, the facility should not conclude that the tank does not represent a vulnerability because the lids and, let's say, ports within that tank are routinely locked. Uh, what FDA Food Defense Plan Builder and, and their thinking is that think of it as a vulnerability and determine what would happen if those measures were not in place. And then after that, uh, document and justify your action for having that um, measure in place. So even though the measure is there, the vulnerability assessment should assume that that measure isn't there. <laughs> it's a little bit of a example, but it makes sense. And, and then sure. put it in, in place and, uh, and show justification how well the measure is working. So as I talked about, this includes locks, area, access controls, monitoring repairs, or supervisors. So that was a significant vulnerability component. Obviously, there are mitigating strategies for those actionable steps that we discussed are those within the process that where the significant vulnerability arises um, or resides. Those must be written and clearly explained how they are mitigating the vulnerability. Some of it is self-explanatory, but let's say going back to the mixed tank example, if you're locking the lid and the ports, the explanation would be something to the effect of uh, these measures will prevent uncontrolled access to the product. So it's most of the measures are simple and explanatory, but they have to be written. So, so far uh, sure. we've talked about uh, significant vulnerabilities and the mitigating strategies, but we have to manage it. This includes monitoring that mitigating strategy uh, to ensure it is being implemented such as ensuring that the lid and documenting that the lid to the mixing tank is consistently locked. And um, there's also a requirement for corrective actions. And takes the, again, similar approach as HACCP, as you mentioned, or a preventive control plan where the appropriate action must be taken to not only identify and correct the problem with implementation of that strategy, but reduce the likelihood that problem will occur again. So very similar to other corrective actions within the HACCP plan. Um, an example would be a door to the facility that we see from time to time that left open to the outside. Maybe somebody went out to take out the trash and just kind of propped it open and left it open. Uh, the issue is that obviously the facility is exposed to the potential of intrusion and, uh, and potential internal, intentional adulteration. Obviously the simple corrective action is to close the door, put a lock on it, but if um, the monitoring identifies that this mitigating strategy is not working, then the facility needs to put together a corrective action and document it, how they're going to ensure that door remains locked. And that's up to the facility and specific to the facility to decide what the best mitigating strategy is, what the corrective action is, and then everything is documented. Of course, just like any other approach, there's a verification component to this. Uh, to ensure the monitoring is being conducted, that the appropriate decisions are being made about the corrective actions, and the strategies are properly implemented. Um, and there's also reanalysis that must be done every three years or sooner, as, as we discussed earlier, if the changes to the process, to the facility, 
um, to the assessment of the vulnerability or how well it's being controlled, and if FDA identifies new threats that dictate the need for analysis. Record keeping is a major requirement as well, and records must be kept for at least two years, much like the food safety plan. Uh, they, they do not need to be kept on site, but must be accessible, and rather promptly, I think, if he expects that upon request. The food defense plan itself must be on site. Um, and it's just important to note that they are subject to the standard protection from public disclosure. So they are considered a trade secret and cannot be disclosed to the public, much like a food safety plan. So uh, these are the approaches for complying to the rule. There are also employee qualification requirements. That also takes the similar approach for preventive control rules for humans and animals. You have to be a qualified individual, trained or experienced, or a combination of both, to conduct the monitoring and corrective action activities on these specific mitigating steps throughout the process. But you also have qualified individuals, and that uh, mirrors closer to a preventive control qualified individuals, and those are generally in supervisory role to prepare the food defense plan, conduct a vulnerability assessment, identify and explain the mitigating strategies, and reanalyze re the plan as needed. Uh, this individual must have a combination of either a training and experience and completed uh, training at least equivalent to the standard curriculum that developed by the FDA. And uh, speaking of which, uh, there is a subcommittee for intentional adulteration within the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance that is working on the curriculum and uh, from what I'm hearing is that the expectation is a shorter training than the two and a half days that's currently being provided and there's some consideration for potential online module training rather than on-site or classroom-based. Uh, but they're thinking something around the four hours. But that, you know, once obviously it's going to be finalized, we'll know exactly what those are. But those are the sort of thinking behind uh, what the facility is supposed to do to approach compliance um, and <clears throat> some of the things that they can do in terms of preventive access, uh, closed circuit TVs, so monitoring devices, and in process uh, controls within specific vulnerability and access points. Back to you, Dave. I know, long one. I, I know payment <laughs> for the, you know, a couple hundred people on the phone with us today. And I, it's tough even for me to grasp my head around, you know, the idea. That, you know, you spent a career in food safety and making sure things are being monitored and safe. And now, you know, it's kind of hurtful a little bit that we have to start looking at, you know, people and resources who might actually try to alter the product, and, you know, on right. with us. So uh, it's, it's tough <laughs> for sure. Um, so if we move on here to the, the next question, you know, if the FDA will require that the food defense plan be validated and tested, right? Uh, it sounds like you had, you kind of hit on this a little bit, right? Uh, it sounds in, like that's in, a, in that, uh, you know, as we discussed, uh, verification of the defense is required to ensure monitoring and uh, corrective actions and proper decision making around those are being made and that uh, mitigating steps are effectively minimizing reducing the vulnerability. However, the FDA does not require validation or testing, uh, unlike preventive controls rules. But I can tell you it is generally a good idea to test it out now and again. And how you do that is up to you. It's really for your own uh, protection, uh, but there's no requirement. Um, but it's not a, to, you know, to do the validation and you can determine where, what specific vulnerability that you'd like to just kind of test out within your system and there are different approaches you can take. But um, in terms of requirement, no. But is it a good oh. idea? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so a best practice would be a good idea to test it, right? But they're not requiring it at this point. Uh, no. Like. no, they're not, they're not that specific on that, no. Got it. That is, a, that is a good update as well. Um, and now you've mentioned a couple of these, Damon, as we've gone through this, right? There are a couple of tools available. It sounds like they're working on some, some other training tools as well. But uh, anything to add to uh, the tools available to help with the, the food central? 
No, absolutely. I think FDA has done a great job um, putting the food defense website that has a defense plan builder. That is a it's an online uh, software that takes you through a step-by-step -step identification of where the facility vulnerabilities are and strategies to mitigate at every step. And at the end, it will give you a complete food defense plan readout. It could be in multiple formats, Microsoft Word, you know, the PDF, Excel, um, Word. And so uh, that tool is, 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 is quite effective. Um, and there's a tutorial online that you could take and takes maybe a total of 30 minutes two components, two for 40, 15 minutes videos to kind of just take you through it. But it's fairly self-explanatory. There's also a, a good mitigation strategies database. So if there's a specific process point that you'd like to get an idea of what are some of the good mitigation strategies, you can just do a drop down, go to a to that specific point and use that to build out and take you through the thought process of what um, mitigation strategies work best within that specific step. Uh, step. And there's also the, uh, always the uh, technical assistance network of, the, of FISMA. Um, obviously, our hope is that they're a little bit quicker on their response, but I'm sure they're working on that. But you can submit the questions, and, and a specialist will respond back to you. So there are certainly those tools to go along with the uh, qualified individual training curriculum that's in the works as well. Sure, and we have we have wonderful professionals like yourself, right, Neymar, who could also help with that, uh, be a tool that might be available to help with those tools. <laughs> huh? Yeah, we'd be happy to help anywhere we can. <laughs> uh, what about compliance dates? Uh, anything that, you know, we should be aware of from the dates on this? I know you mentioned some of them are further out. There's some exemptions, there's things like that, but anything uh, yeah, we focus on no, definitely. I think we, sure. We we touched on on what they considered a very small business, and that's a business that has generates revenue less than ten million. So they have to provide upon request that with in a three year average, that's their um, revenue. Those companies have five years from July twenty sixth. So in twenty twenty one is their uh, the date for them to make sure they have all their documentation in a row to justify their very small business status. In terms of small businesses, those will be subject to the food defense rule, and those are the companies that have less than 500 full-time equivalent employees. Those companies have four years to comply, so July 26, 2020. Every other business has three years, so 2019. July 26, 2019 is the compliance date for a lot of companies. Got it. It's a moment on our calendars, right? We're uh, we're all walking towards it. Uh, and I know we're coming <laughs> right. up on the, the you know, uh, we're we're uh, we're coming up on the tail end of this. Uh, I know we we promote these as, as 30 minute uh, webinars. So I we've gone through the main questions here. Uh, we will open this up now for some uh, Q and A from the from the audience, right? I see that I have some uh, questions in here as well that I'll we'll, we'll discuss. So if you do have the time to uh, to stay on, we're going to address some of these questions. Uh, Payment, I uh, I do understand you have a couple minutes here with us too, so so we'll hit on those. Of course. Um, I would like to thank you again for joining us, Payment. It's always uh, always great to to talk with you and, and get some of this information out and and maybe in especially for me a little bit more of layman's terms. So I appreciate that. Um, Obviously, the organization, uh, the HSN Group, is wonderful in this way. I just mentioned them as a, a great tool that can be used in uh, doing gap analysis and understanding FPA records and food safety plan requirements, right, uh, even things around GFSI compliance. So, uh, again, Payne, we, we appreciate your time and, and the great organization that you work for and the, the great group of uh, consultants that work with you. So um, if you. anyone needs any help, obviously, uh, the HSN Group will be great. And just a shameless little promotion here, since 50 Chain is the host, um, we are a software company, uh, really focusing on a lot of the things that uh, Payman mentioned as we went through this, right, an overall FSQA operating system that uh, can help you from 
kind of go through the whole guideline of your supply chain, right, around all the way through vendor and HACCP and HARPC, which we mentioned, and uh, even capturing some of those monitoring activities that Pema mentioned today and, and also storing and having some of that documentation as well. So um, thanks again for the time. Let's look at a couple of these questions. So um, there's uh, a couple that have come in here, uh, and let's see here as I scroll down through it. Um, Here's one specific. Uh, it's pretty good. Okay, on what, what do transportation providers need to be aware of, kind of in that vertical or that you know part of our industry? Is there anything specific that stands out for transportation providers? Uh, so it's a great question, and it, it was discussed uh, by the FDA. Uh, in most cases, those are covered under under the sanitary transport rule. Uh, or or the produce rule, uh, or a combination of of, of, of each. So, uh, in most cases, yes, there are vulnerabilities there, especially with tankers and, and bulk uh, shippers. Uh, so, those are definitely areas that uh, are of specific interest, but most those are mostly covered under the sanitary transport rule, to, to the extent that I understand. Got it. Got it. What about the, here's another one, um, and I, I'll probably miss this name, Markello, maybe. Uh, it, must the food defense plan be separate from the food safety plan? Is it a, actually a separate plan itself? It is. It is a separate plan. Um, food safety is uh, takes into consideration multiple other uh, components uh, where the risk of a uh, let's say a transient pathogen organism that gets in and can adulterate the product. But with the food defense plan, we're looking at how can we prevent intentional adulteration as opposed to unintentional adul adulteration due to just bad practices at the facility. So intentional adulteration, and it's a separate plan. As I mentioned, there is the FDA website uh, that has a food defense plan builder that I think does a great job walking the companies and individuals through identifying where the vulnerabilities are within the system and what are some of the mitigation strategies to address them. So it is a separate plan. It takes some of the similar approaches in terms of vulnerability being somewhat similar to a hazard analysis and the monitoring corrective action, documentation, reanalysis. So the approach is the same, but it is a different plan, yeah. Got it. Uh, and, and here's another one that came in from Martha, actually. Uh, she made a comment, and I'm going to obviously look for your expertise here on this panel, but uh, it says, right now there's, a, there's an online FDA course, Food Defense 101. Uh, will this be accepted for the qualified individual, or will it be replaced? Uh, if someone already has it, would they be grandfathered in? How about that? That's a good question, and I, and I quite honestly, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be accepted. I think my read of it is that FDA is developing a separate curriculum that will probably take into account a lot of what's already available in that, and but just per perhaps add more to it and components of the rule as it's finalized. So um, those who have taken it, those who have read it, are probably a step ahead. But my expectation is that um, the curriculum that's going to be developed is going to be a separate separate course and one that folks need to take. But every indication is that it's going to be an online course, so you won't have to travel anywhere for three days like you're doing right now for the preventive control rules. Got it. Um, the, uh, the, there's another good question, quick question from Mohammed here. Does, does plant security policy fall under food defense? Is that it sounds like that's kind of it's similar, right? Uh, the yeah, security the, policy that, that may incorporate some of this. If we're talking about the physical facility security, yes, it does, uh, because you're looking at the entire facility vulnerability, uh, whether it's on the access by outside individuals uh, through gates and doors and railings or however it is that we're keeping, but also within the process itself, uh, locks, doors, shields, you know, things that uh, specifically, because we also have to consider 
that it could be an inside job. And if he does specifically recognize that and, and request that you know, during the vulnerability assessment, that the focus should be both on the external intentional adulteration and in an inside job as well. So, yes, the facility security is a component of that. Our jobs just keep expanding right now. you got to come up with anything possible, right? Is there anything possible that could ever happen? <laughs> you have to look at all the right, vulnerabilities, bro. yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah, you know, sure. their companies are doing a lot as is. So the measures are in place. Um, the assessment, as we discussed, needs to take into account as if those measures aren't in place to do the vulnerability assessment. But then when you look at the mitigation strategies, then you can then go back and say, no, we do have this in place. We do prevent uh, outside individuals, drivers during the bulk uh, liquid uh, receiving and, and transfer. Those are uh, quarantined to specific areas so they don't gain access to the rest of the facilities. But yeah. Got it. Uh, and it, this, this came in from Ray. Is there a timeline for the guidance documents that you mentioned? Uh, I, think, uh, uh, I wish there was. <laughs> no, unfortunately yeah. not. We're expecting it any time. Uh, obviously, there is a, a bit more time that the companies have to comply to the food defense uh, plan and, and rule. And if you're uh, greater than 500, obviously, you have uh, three years. Under 500, you have four. And if you're a very small business, five years. So that timeline, uh, I think, probably has also given FDA uh, a little bit more leeway in terms of uh, developing the guidance documents. Our expectation is that they're not going to wait that long. That's going to come out soon. But if I were to prioritize, there are other rules that are going to be in effect come September, and those are probably given higher priority in terms of the guidelines. Fair enough. Um, and there were a couple here. I know we're coming up on our time, so I, I, I appreciate all the questions that are coming in. Um, there, there was a, a question I thought that was kind of intriguing that came in um, uh, around uh, from Ed, actually, right? How, how much different is this than the food security program required after September 11th, actually? Is, that, is it? I think it takes into account difference? a lot of uh, it, takes, it does take into account a big part of that. I think it's the Food Defense Plan Builder does uh, largely consider those measures for, for security in development of this one. So they do go hand in hand. It's not exactly the same, but it's, uh, but it's very similar. Um, other companies may even have existing other food defense plans. and. And so if you do, uh, you're probably quite a ways in into meeting this food defense rule, but uh, you want to make sure that you compare it to, you know, perhaps going through the food defense builder and identify all the vulnerabilities. The expectation is that, you know, if it's been a little while since you've done this, then perhaps there might be additional vulnerabilities that need to be taken into account. But uh, if you have an existing program, uh, you're quite a ways in in meeting this rule. Got it. Um, and I think that we'll, so again, I, we'll, we'll take some of these questions that we, we have here and we'll add them into our future FISMA, FISMA uh, presentations, which, by the way, uh, I will highlight. But I have one more good one here I think that uh, I'd like you to address. But uh, just to highlight, we are doing a special FISMA Friday session uh, in July, July 29th. Uh, it'll be an hour-long session. So uh, this is something that we're looking forward to, right? And uh, <laughs> obviously, I think that everybody else might. It'll be a great session to join, right? So uh, the the one we'll end with here, uh, Paymon, is how does this affect foreign suppliers? Will food defense plan be required as part of uh, the foreign supplier verification program as well? Uh, foreign suppliers, uh, to the extent that they are a FDA registered facility, um, even in a foreign soil, are required to develop a food defense plan. Yeah. Uh, if, if not, then obviously uh, as part of the supplier verification and qualification, I think those are important considerations to, uh, to consider and, and to, you know, find out how they are 
managing the security and, and of their products, but in terms of the regulatory requirements, uh, as I understand it, applies to those international companies, foreign companies that are registered FDA facilities. Got it. Um, and actually, this one's, a, uh, I, I said that was it, but I, I do think this is a good one for everyone on uh, who's still on the call. Um, the, is there an address to go to? You had mentioned uh, earlier that there were some tools out online. Is that just going to the FDA, FDA website, or is there, a, is there a specific site yes. to go to? There is, and I will be happy to send it to you, um, what the exact website is. But if you just type in Food Defense Plan Builder FDA and, and Google, it will take you to that site. And then there's a link that takes you to the actual online tool to to do a vulnerability assessment and, and build your food defense plan. So um, I'll be happy to follow up. I don't have the exact web address in front of me, but I could be happy to do that. But it's, it's easily searchable yeah. online or yeah. through the FDA. <laughs> it's that famous Google, right? Google knows everything. Google knows where it is. Google might even have a plan builder for you. <laughs> um, so I, sure. I, 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 uh, I greatly, again, appreciate your time today, Damon, and, and everyone who uh, joined here, right? Um, we're up against the time. I know there were some, some questions that came in. Uh, we'll try to address those on the July session as well. Um, but I appreciate everyone's time today here for joining us, and, and hopefully you found it as valuable as, as I did, for sure. And, and Damon, thanks again. And, and uh, everyone enjoy your, your Friday and, and hopefully a, a nice weekend. So thanks a lot for everybody. Pleasure. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.